Free your soul. It's 1891, and a young woman walks into her attic room in the Latin Quarter of Paris. It's dark, dingy, and cold. So cold, in fact. During the winter months, she wears every stitch of clothing she owns just to stay warm. Her studies are demanding and require extreme focus and concentration because French is not her native tongue. Placing her stack of books on the small table in the center of the room, she lights an oil lamp to chase away the gloom and tries to remember if she has eaten today. Most likely not, she decides. Well, a cup of tea and a few slices of bread will have to suffice. When you're a young female student struggling to find your way in the male-dominated world of science, eating takes a backseat to studying, and she is determined to become a scientist. She pours herself a cup of tea and sits down at the table, allowing herself a brief moment of longing for her homeland a thousand miles away. Her chosen path will not be swift or easy, but no matter, she tells herself. She knows she is here for a reason. There is a purpose to her life, and that she is gifted for some thing. And that thing, no matter what it is, must be attained, no matter the cost. Taking a deep breath, she exhales slowly, chooses a book from the stack, and prepares for another long night of studying. Hello, and welcome to Season 2 of the Aquitaine Project Podcast. I'm Marlo Mead, your host, guide, and fellow traveler, on a journey where together we draw upon the lessons, wisdom, and experiences of women past and present. This season, I am so very excited to share with you the stories, voices, and legacies of more fabulous women. For me, these women, who I affectionately call my bright lighters, transcend time teaching us lessons we can use in our own lives each and every day, inspiring us to become bright lighters in our own right. So get ready to step into the light of some pretty remarkable women and learn a little, grow a little, laugh a little, and shine a lot. For centuries, great men of science have gathered to discuss, debate, and share their knowledge and findings with each other and the world. Conspicuously absent from the halls of scientific research are countless women who for centuries also have contributed to every discipline of natural science from astronomy to zoology. In her 2012 book, Women Scientists in America, in which she investigates the systemic way the field of science deterred women, historian Margaret Rossiter states, It is important to note early that women's historically subordinate place in science was not a coincidence and was not due to any lack of merit on their part. It was due to the camouflage intentionally placed over their presence in science, end quote. To put it another way, According to the male-dominated fields of science, especially natural science, women were not welcome and were intentionally overlooked, dismissed, and written out of the annals of science for centuries. In the case of this episode's Bright Lighter, a woman and scientist of remarkable intelligence, resolve, and tenacity, who, despite her world-changing discoveries, was considered by many male scientists as merely a helper to her husband who was lauded as the true genius behind their scientific breakthroughs. Nothing could have been farther from the truth. Despite the short-sighted sexist views of her time, Maria Sklodowska, better known to the world as Madame Marie Curie, 
would become one of the most renowned scientists in history. Her tenacious pursuit of scientific knowledge and advancements in physics, chemistry, and radioactivity, a term she happened to invent, is a hallmark of her research, writings, and laboratory experiments. But her road was hardly a smooth one. In fact, it wasn't much of a road at all. She would have to blaze much of the trail herself. Fortunately, the many obstacles Marie encountered along the way were no match for her love for scientific discovery, her devotion to her husband and family, and her scientific and medical advancements that would ultimately save the lives of millions, ironically, costing her her own. Let's learn what this pioneering bright lighter has to teach us about the power of tenacity when working to achieve our own life ambitions. Marie Curie is probably the most famous female scientist of all time. Given the age in which she lived, succeeding as a scientist in a field traditionally dominated by men was an amazing accomplishment, but she was determined to succeed, and succeed she did, being the first woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize in 1903 for her research into radioactivity, and later winning a second Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1911. She is still the only woman to have won two Nobel Prizes in two different sciences. Maria Salome Slodowska, known today as Marie Curie, was born on November 7, 1867 in Warsaw, Poland. Both her parents were prominent teachers. Her father taught physics and mathematics, subjects Marie would later pursue. Her mother, who was the director of a private girls' school, died when Marie was 11 years old. Life in Poland was tough during the latter part of the 19th century. Warsaw was under Russian rule and laws forbade the speaking of Polish or the learning of Polish history. However, these laws backfired, causing many Poles to be even more proud of their Polish heritage. Marie's family was hit hard by the Polish national uprisings that broke out during the 19th century with the aim of restoring Polish independence. Her father was fired by his Russian supervisors for his pro-Polish beliefs, creating a great financial burden on the family. The harshness of the Tsarist regime installed in Marie a deep patriotic love for her native country. From a young age, Marie was an excellent student and had a keen interest in science, something her father strongly encouraged. She graduated from middle and high school with high honors and set her sights on attending college, but as a woman, she was barred from entering the university in Warsaw. Actually, most European countries at the time refused the enrollment of women. So, in an act of defiance, Marie enrolled in the Floating University, a secret institution that, for security reasons, moved its location regularly to avoid detection by the Russian government. The Floating or Flying University provided clandestine education to Polish women in the subjects of science, math, history, philosophy, and religion. Marie, a rebel at heart, thrived during her time there. As teenagers, Marie and her older sister Branya made a pact to support each other through college. Setting their sights on Western Europe, they decided when Branya had completed her medical studies, Marie would join her in Paris to begin her own university education. Now that is true sisterly love and support. In 1891, Marie moved to Paris to attend the prestigious Sorbonne University to study physics and mathematics. On her entrance papers, she changed her name to the French version of Maria, her Polish name, to Marie. Even with help from Bronia, Marie had barely enough money to pay her tuition. Back then, like today, a university degree can be frightfully expensive. Surviving largely on bread and tea and sometimes fainting from near starvation, she somehow managed to graduate in 1893 tops in her class in physics and a year later tops in her class in mathematics. Armed with two degrees, she was ready and eager to begin her research. But where was the question? In 1894, Marie met Pierre Curie, a professor at the School of Physics and Chemistry. Pierre graciously offered to share his lab with Marie. A year later, they were married. With a deep love for each other and a shared passion for scientific research, Marie and Pierre would become a scientific supercouple with a legacy of work and research that lives on today. 
Here's a fun fact to show you just how focused Marie Curie was about her work. She refused to wear a traditional wedding dress. Instead, she bought a dark blue dress which she could wear to work in the lab every day. The couple would eventually have two daughters, Irene and Eve. Irene would eventually follow her mother's footsteps and together with her husband Frederick, earn her own Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1935, making them the second couple in history to win the Nobel Prize together. Like mother, like daughter, literally. But what about Eve, you must be asking? Eve did not follow the family tradition of scientific research. She worked as a journalist and authored her mother's biography, Madame Curie. She committed herself to work for UNICEF, providing help to children and mothers in developing countries. Although Eve did not win a Nobel Prize, her husband Henry did in 1965 on behalf of UNICEF, completing the Curie family legacy of five Nobel Prizes. I am pretty sure that's a record. Determined to further her education, Marie pursued a Ph.D. in physics and decided to do her thesis on radiation, recently discovered in uranium by Henri Becquerel, a French engineer and physicist. In 1896, she began her own research on uranium. Pierre, whose scientific research focused on magnets, set aside his work to join forces with Marie and support her in her work on radioactivity. Through physically exhausting work and long hours of research, Marie discovered a new radioactive element, which she named polonium after her beloved Poland. In 1898, polonium was added to the periodic table. The periodic table, for those of you who are curious, is a tabular array of the chemical elements organized by atomic number, from the element with the lowest atomic number, hydrogen, to the element with the highest atomic number, organicin. That is your chemistry lesson of the day. The Curies also discovered radium and continued to advance the study of radioactivity. For her research in radiation phenomena, Marie won her first Nobel Prize in 1903. Many French academics originally proposed only her husband and Henri Becquerel should have received the award, but Pierre Curie insisted that his wife share the honor. After all, it was her invaluable research and countless experiments that produced such impressive results. Good man, Pierre. The Nobel Prize brought the couple fame and financial success, and they continued their research working side by side. Pierre was appointed as a professor at the Sorbonne, and plans for a new lab were underway. The Curies were excited to expand upon their research and further the field of radiology. Sadly, in 1906, Pierre was run over by a horse and carriage and was killed. Marie was devastated and threw herself more deeply into her work. Her natural tenacity to overcome obstacles allowed her to focus on the joys of science. She believed scientific research was a public good and was determined to continue the work she and Pierre had shared. After Pierre's death in a very surprising move, Marie took over Pierre's classes at the Sorbonne, making her the first woman to teach at the prestigious university. History has it that hundreds of people, students and non-students, crowded into the auditorium and lined the hallways to hear her very first lecture. Between 1906 and 1911, Marie continued teaching and conducting research. After Pierre's death, the Sorbonne dragged its feet about building a proper lab, and it wasn't until she threatened to leave that the university relented. Despite being a Nobel laureate, Marie was denied admittance to the French Academy of Sciences and was vilified in the right-wing press as a foreigner and an atheist. Undeterred, she remained focused on her work, and in 1910, she succeeded in isolating radium and defined an international standard for radioactive emissions called a Curie, named for her and Pierre. Diligent, persistent, and determined to succeed in her research, in 1911, Marie was presented with her second Nobel Prize, this time in the field of chemistry for her work in isolating radium. Soon after Marie received her second Nobel Prize, two laboratories were constructed at the Sorbonne. In one of the laboratories, Marie led a team of researchers analyzing radioactivity, while the other laboratory was used to explore possible cancer treatments. 
Following the outbreak of World War I in 1914, Marie developed a mobile X-ray unit that could be transported near to the front lines and allowed her to analyze soldiers' injuries. With her 17-year-old daughter, Irene, Marie worked at one of the casualty clearing stations where they X-rayed soldiers to detect bullets and shrapnel in their wounds and monitor fractures. Also in 1914, the International Red Cross made Marie the head of the radiologic service where she helped to train doctors and medical assistants in the latest techniques. After the war ended, Marie returned to her work and in 1919 published her personal account of the war in her book Radiology in War. She continued to work with radium and sought new advances for its uses. Unfortunately, the Curies did not fully appreciate, or perhaps as some scholars have suggested, ignored the danger of the radioactive material they handled. By the 1920s, Marie was suffering from the effects of extreme radiation sickness. Continuing to work for as long as she could, despite her declining health, she wrote countless journals and completed her book entitled Radiology, which was published posthumously in 1935. On July 4, 1934, Marie Curie died of aplastic anemia, a condition that was caused by prolonged exposure to radium and polonium. Although the very things she loved scientific research, laboratory experiments, and her fearless pursuit of knowledge were the death of her, she will be remembered as a symbol for girls and women everywhere of the power we each have to overcome whatever stands in our way and achieve our destiny. Okay, let me be very clear. I am not suggesting by any means you pursue a life or work that will ultimately kill you. I am saying to achieve what we want to accomplish in life. Developing a healthy dose of tenacity allows us to keep going when things get tough or obstacles get in our way. For Marie Curie, it was her persistence of purpose, her inherent tenacity that drove her to fight for her place in science and work toward her ambitions, which led to world-changing scientific advancements. I want you to think for a moment. What comes to mind when you hear the words tenacious or tenacity? For me, being tenacious is about not quitting on yourself or your goals. It's a great quality to have when you want to accomplish anything in life. As Marie said, life is not easy for any of us. But what of that? We must have perseverance and above all confidence in ourselves. Just because we're tenacious doesn't mean we won't face setbacks. What tenacity allows us to do is not be overwhelmed or undermined by them. It's that stick to itiveness that keeps us focused and positive and confident in our ultimate success. It helps us to be patient and not give in or give up too soon or too easily. In his book, Success 101, What Every Leader Needs to Know, John C. Maxwell offers us a few really good ideas to help us understand and develop the benefits of tenacity. 1. Giving all that you have, not more than you have. Some people lack tenacity because they think their project will require a superhuman effort to get done, and they don't believe they have what it takes to make it happen. Maxwell states, being tenacious requires that you give 100% not more, but certainly not less. If you give your all, you afford yourself every opportunity possible for success. 2. Working with determination, not waiting on destiny. Tenacious people don't rely on luck, fate, or destiny for their success. And when conditions become difficult, they keep working. They know that trying times are no time to quit trying. Say that three times fast. They know that trying times or n <laughs> they know that trying times or no <laughs> one more time they know that trying times are no time to quit trying and <laughs> that's what makes the difference 3 quitting when the job is done not when you're tired it's not the first but the last step that makes the difference that is where the race is won if you are to succeed, you have to keep pushing beyond what you think you can do and find out what you're really capable of. I know in my own life, there are areas in which I am much more tenacious than others or where I haven't given it my all. 
I think we can all admit to the same. I came across a 2020 article by Bill Abate published in Illumination titled Why You Need Tenacity in Your Life. There's a link to it on the episode page on the Aquitaine Project podcast website. What I found most useful was his ideas on building the skill of tenacity. According to Bill, it starts by making up your mind to win and be a winner. Keep moving forward toward what you want. Don't give up on your dreams and don't give in to quitting. I like that. Don't give in to quitting. It's so easy sometimes to quit, isn't it? Ask any athlete who practices her skills hundreds of times a day because she knows the only way to be the best is to put in the work. Or a teacher who is faced with ever-changing school policies when all he wants to do is focus on his students. Or a business owner who struggles month after month to build her clientele in poor economic times if they've ever wanted to chuck it all and find something easier and less demanding. And most will probably say, Absolutely. But they don't, because they know the only way to succeed is by staying focused on their goals when the going gets tough. He also says it's important to hold on to what you believe. Be resolute and determined. Be open and willing to learn. Don't let failure stop you. Instead, see the opportunity in it. Be ready to listen, adjust, and change while fighting for what you value. Here are a few suggestions from Bill, along with my very special commentary of some things we can do to build tenacity into our lives. Manage your thinking. If you believe you won't succeed, you are absolutely right. If you believe you will succeed, guess what? You are absolutely right. You get to choose what you believe. Develop a vision for what you want. Let's say, like Marie, you want to become a scientist. Get clear about it, figure out the steps to make it happen, then hold on for dear life. Stick with it through thick and thin and seek out and rely on people who can help get you there. It may take time, much longer than you think, but as Marie showed us, it can be done. Never allow the fear of failing to control you. Many of us struggle with this one, don't we? Come on, be honest. Giving up or never even trying because we are afraid to fail leads to a life of regret. Remember that. Never give up or quit on your dreams. This is my personal favorite. If I had given up on the Aquitaine Project, and believe me, there were and still times when I struggled to get things right, none of you would be hearing my voice right now or discovering the amazing women I love to share with you or learning about life lessons like tenacity. You are very welcome. Surround yourself with tenacious people. They will help keep you focused and on track. Some of their dogged determination just might rub off on you. Aim high. Don't settle for less than what you're worth, less than what you're good at, or less than what you can do. Just don't settle, okay? By building the skills of tenacity, we can excel in all areas of our lives as employees, co-workers, leaders, spouses, friends, and human beings. As one of my other favorite Brightlighters said, the most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. Amelia Earhart. So, let's see tenacity as a good thing on our journey to taking control of our destiny and achieving what we want out of life. Women have always done scientific work, but have rarely received the recognition they deserve. Marie Curie is one of the few women who is widely recognized as a prominent female scientist. Her work in radioactivity, physics, and chemistry opened the door for advancements in scientific research and medicine. She broke new ground for women in all fields of science, becoming the first woman to receive a doctorate of science in France, the first and only woman to receive not one, but two Nobel Prizes in two separate categories, the first woman to teach at the Sorbonne, the first Nobel laureate whose child also won a Nobel Prize, And if that's not enough, she is the first woman to be buried in the Pantheon in Paris. Madame Marie Curie was indeed a woman of many firsts and a true pioneer in her field, and as such will forever be counted among the world's greatest scientists. Her remarkable legacy continues to inspire generations of girls and women to pursue careers in STEM, 
science, technology, engineering, and math, and achieve ever greater advancements. Her strength of purpose and tenacity in achieving her goals, despite the many obstacles she faced, is a lesson we can all take to heart. She held her ground, she knew she had a job to do, and she refused to let anything stand in her way. So in honor of this bright lighter of science who changed the world by never giving up on herself or her life's work, let's challenge ourselves to tenaciously pursue and achieve our own goals, dreams, and ambitions. Why I love this woman. So the other night I was lying in bed reflecting on my day. When, out of the blue, my husband asked me, Why do you love Marie Curie? Startled out of my pre-sleep coziness, I began rambling about her accomplishments and the difficulties she'd faced during her life, her love and partnership with Pierre, etc., etc., etc. As I was listening to myself, I realized I did not fully answer his question, so I stopped speaking for a moment and repeated the question to myself. Why do you love Marie Curie? Taking a breath to center my thoughts, I said, I love Madame Marie Curie for her ability to see the wonderful potential of science and her dogged determination, despite what it cost her, to stay singularly focused on her life's work, even though in the end it killed her. She was fearless in her pursuit of knowledge and determined to share that knowledge with the world. I also love the fact that she was not a one-dimensional scientific brain locked away in her laboratory, callously ignoring the outside world. Marie had love in her life and a deep devotion to her husband, who was also her scientific partner, and to her two daughters. She was academically, socially, and politically active, and believed her gifts as a scientist were meant to improve herself and, by extension, make the world a better place. Her pursuit of scientific knowledge was a joy to Marie and a great boon for humanity. But perhaps what I love most about Marie is her tenacious approach to her work, despite the obstacles she faced. Being a woman of science in a male-dominated field, the physical toll her research demanded, the pressures of proving herself a legitimate scientist in her own right, especially after her husband tragically died, and the harsh and unfounded criticism of many of her male contemporaries. She knew her work was important. She knew she could do it, and she knew she had a scientific responsibility to see it through. Madame Marie Curie is the bright lighter I look to when I need more stick to itiveness when working to achieve what I want most out of life. To learn more about the life, incredible work, and scientific contributions of Marie Curie, visit the Aquitaine Project podcast website at www.theaquitaineproject.com and click on Marie's portrait. There you'll find links about her groundbreaking work and many advancements in science, as well as a few resources to help you develop your own tenacious attitude. Thanks for listening. And feel free to connect with me on Instagram at The Aquitaine Project, LinkedIn, just look for Marlo Mead and I'll pop up, on Facebook at The Aquitaine Project Podcast Group, and on my YouTube channel, The Aquitaine Project. Until next time, my bright lighters, shine bright, tap into your tenacious side, and don't stop until you make your dreams come true.